Hello everyone, welcome back. If this is your first time here, my name is Teresa. I'm a surface pattern designer and watercolor artist. Let's talk about water control. Guess what? It's not all about the water. Well, it's largely about the water, but it's not completely about the water. It's also about the paper that we're using, the brush that we're using, our technique, our understanding of how water behaves, and one more little thing, our willingness to embrace its power and to give over some control to the water. Today we're going through several exercises that will help us understand water's behavior so that we can use it to our benefit in our artwork rather than fighting with it all the time. I hope you'll join me. Your choice of watercolor paper can make or break your artwork, so it's important to use the right one for your purpose. Hot pressed is really great when you want smooth edges or you're painting with something that's a little more opaque, like with gouache or just a thick consistency with watercolor. But if you're trying to paint in a loose style on hot pressed, you are likely going to struggle to keep your paint wet enough to get all the movement that you want. For instance, if you want a lot of movement like that, it's going to be hard to achieve with hot pressed paper. Again, something like this. There's lots of movement going on here. This was easily achieved on cold pressed, but I would have struggled to do it on hot pressed because it just dries so fast. So hot pressed is great for certain uses. Cold pressed, you'll want to choose between 100% cotton, which is the gold standard and by far the best paper. Um, there are a lot of different brands. Saunders just the one I happen to like, but as long as you're using 100% cotton, then you are using a good quality paper. However, it's very expensive, so you could use a blend, and I would suggest pay a little bit more to get a good blend if you're going to do that. Canson XL is an excellent blend. It mimics, to me, the closest to 100% cotton that I could find. Now, if you're using a much cheaper blend, it, it could be your, your paper. Your problem could be your paper. So try out some different papers and just see if that helps with whatever problem you happen to be having. Let's talk very quickly about types of brushes because that could be your issue as well. Look through your brushes and decide which are your favorites. And then we are going to choose one brush to practice with until we overcome whatever water control problems you're having. So first, mop and quill brushes are excellent for loose watercolors, but they're not going to be good for practicing and figuring out what your, your water control problem is because they are very plump. Any brush that's really plump right here is going to hold lots and lots of water in their belly. And if you're already having trouble controlling the water, then that's just going to add to your, your problems. So let's not practice with those just yet. Then brushes like this, specialty brushes such as a filbert or a cat's tongue, again, great brushes, but not good for figuring out what our water control problem is. Look how thin they are. Those are not going to hold much water. So those are not going to be good for practicing with just yet. Round brush would be my brush of choice, especially something like an eight. You could go down to a six or possibly even a 10, but a good basic round brush is going to be your best bet. Now, don't jump up to something like this because this is not going to behave quite the same. So we don't wanna complicate our issues. Let's, let's not do that yet. Just a basic round brush. You could alternatively use a black velvet silver brush if you're already familiar with this brush. I use this brush in place of a round brush most of the time. I love this brush. I'm already familiar with it. I use it a whole lot. So I am going to practice my water control 
with this brush. Now I consider these two very good choices. So either one you want to go with to, to practice with is fine. And then after you solve your water control problem in your practice sessions with one of these brushes, then you can start trying to use these other brushes to see how they're going to behave. Now for the really fun part. So I've mixed up some blue that we're going to use and some green. And I like to do this in my palette or, you know, a separate plate, whatever, um, so that I can see the consistencies because the key to getting really smooth granulation and spreading, not granulation, but spreading is from using the same consistencies. Now, of course, that's not always the case, but that's just a best rule of thumb to go by because the amount of water in your pigment will really dictate what's going to happen as we're going to see. So let's put this here. I think I've got those pretty close. Um, we need our paper towel. So we want to get our brush wet and we can either dab it on the paper towel now and then go to our paint or we can do it in the opposite order. Rinse our brush, go to the paint and then dab it. It just kind of depends and I do it both ways. I don't think there's any right or wrong. It just depends on the situation. Like I already have good consistency here, but I do like to know how much I have in my brush. So sometimes I'll do both. If I think I have a little too much water and then I want to get really good here. And I don't want it to pool. The first thing we're going to do is just do a straight swatch, mainly for comparison purposes later. I know you probably already know how to do this. So this is just dry paper, so it's wet on dry. And I just want to, I'm not going to completely fill my box because I want to be able to see these edges. All right, and I really didn't have to go over that so many times. Okay, so that's wet on dry. I just want that for comparison purposes later on down the road. And now I want to do a wet on wet again for comparison purposes. And these are really good skills to have. You really want to get good at doing both of these things. They're very basic. We use these two a lot in our watercolor artwork. And I'm sure you know that we just want to sheen here. No puddling, just a little sheen. And I took too much off there. All right, now a little pigment. And so since it's wet, it's going to spread quickly. See, it's spreading very quickly. So you want to practice that and get a feel for that. I'm not going to keep going over it. So this color, this is Prussian blue and it's going to dry fairly light compared to the way that it goes onto the paper. That's just the nature of that color. Now, because this was wet before with clear water, we're going to get those nice soft edges. So let's do another wet on wet. So let's talk about blooms. I love blooms. They add so much to your artwork. Now, some artists really don't like blooms and that's just fine. I do. I think they add a lot of extra texture that can sometimes be hard to put in your artwork without an actual bloom. So, it really helps if you can embrace things like that. 
Okay, that's a nice even sheen. And I'm already out of blue. So let's grab it real quick. So I want this nice and juicy. A bloom will happen when you have pigment down and there's some pooling here too, which I'm glad to see. I had a lot of water on my brush, so now it's going to cause some pooling. And we'll talk about pooling in a second. First, let's talk about blooms. So we have our wash down. Now, let me grab another color. Let's do a different blue. And I am going to get it very, very juicy, but it has a lot of water, okay? There's a lot of water in here. I'll add just a touch more even. And if I touch this, notice how this was so heavy with water and pigment that when it touched this, that didn't have as much water or pigment in it, this pushed all that pigment that was already down out. That water displaced what was already on the paper. That is what causes blooms. So sometimes this may happen to you when you're painting, you're painting, you're very happy, you're painting, and you reach in to paint something beside where you're painting. And when it touches whatever's laying next to it, it will push that pigment out and cause a bloom. I hope that made sense. That was, I don't know that I explained that very well. Well, let's just do a good example right here. And we're going to talk a lot about blooming and all that today. So let's get us a good example of when two colors touch. So let's just paint a pretend flower right here. I, I won't do I won't take the time to do a, a real flower, so let's just do a little swatch. That will represent our pretend flower. And so I want a, a good amount of moisture here, not overly. And then I'm going to clean my brush and grab the green so that we do a leaf. And so when you're painting and you want a leaf to just skim your flower to give that nice blending, I'll see if we can make this happen. So we're just going to skim it and there we go. So if we had had a whole lot of pigment on our brush, our moisture on the brush, it would have caused a bloom, but it looks like this is going to work just fine. They are feathering into each other just a little bit because there's an equality of moisture. So they're not competing against each other. It's not dispersing out like a bloom would, so it's not merging as much as I would have wanted, but this is great. This is, this is just fine. All right, let's talk about pooling. And then we're going to come back and talk about this in a minute. So pooling happens when you have too much water on your paper. And sometimes that can happen because you keep adding pigment, different colors, for instance, to a space. I see pooling a lot in my work and I absolutely love it. I let it happen on purpose. So let's get us some pigment down here. Pooling will cause hard lines sometimes. It can also cause blooms in certain situations. But I like to paint, let's say, a leaf. And I will drop in different colors in that leaf because I love the merging that happens with the different colors. So let me grab, let's try a little violet with it. It's fun to put different colors in here so that we can see the different things that are happening. And I forgot to mix up my violet. So let me just grab that. And now we'll drop in just a little bit. I love the way this looks. 
but I am not going to lift any of it out. Now, oftentimes I will do that when I'm painting. If I just keep adding color and keep adding color, let's see what other color. Let, let's just take some of our green and we can put some green in here. I just want a lot of pooling. That's my goal here. So if I'm doing a leaf and I'm adding different colors of green because I really like the way that that looks, then I will let it merge like this. And now see how that, there's a huge puddle right there. If we let that dry just like that, it will be a very intense color and there's going to be a hard line. There's already hard lines out here. All, even though I covered this whole thing with water, because now I've added so much pigment and water, it has pushed everything out. So we are going to get a dark line. This one, it's not pushing quite so far out to that line, so it's not dark yet. It may get there, I'm not sure, but we will definitely have a darker line over here. Now, so what I was saying about the leaf, what I would do usually is we've allowed this to merge in with the blue and now that it has settled in this one big pocket, we can touch it and pick it up and then take it to our towel. And then we can touch it again and keep doing that back and forth until that puddle's gone. But I don't really wanna do that for our experiment. I want you to see how it looks. Oops, I got a little messy there. I want you to see how it looks when you let it dry just in the puddle. So I'm loving this square actually. <laughs> I love that. Okay, another thing that can give people trouble, and I'm, I'm talking to myself here, <laughs> is blending. So let's get prepared to do some blending work. We want to get, I'm going to do two different squares for this. And then we need to let it dry and we'll come back to it. But, and I don't have to fill up the whole thing. So we just want a nice little square there. And we want two of them because we're gonna do we're going to do a wrong one and a right one. Because I keep picking my brush up, it's leaving these little spots. And it's just the extra pigment that's coming off my brush when I stop to pick it up. And sometimes those disappear and sometimes they don't. But just so you know, that's not real pooling. All right, let's let those dry. Now, what if this one, for instance, what if we did our pretend flower? Let's do a pretend flower, just like this one. My pigment's gotten pretty watery there. That's all right. All right, there's my pretend flower. And let's say that I'm doing a composition and I go on, I do a lot of other flowers and I, I plan to come back to do the leaves, okay? And this starts to dry. It's going to dry at a different rate over this area because maybe it wasn't as saturated over here as it is right here. If you see, I can tell that this is dry already. This is still very wet. So we have a drying time that's a little bit staggered on most everything that we're doing. That can really affect what happens. So I'm, I'm waiting for this to get just a little more dry. And if this gets too dry, and then I try to do my leaf, it's not going to blend like this one. Okay, this one's, this one's about where I want it. So I want you to see, so we come back, it's really too dry. And I'm going to come back to do my leaf. That is what's going to happen. 
we are not going to get very good blending. We are going to have a definite hard line. And in fact, it even lifted a little bit of the first layer here. So you may be very unhappy with that look in your artwork. So my point is timing is everything. You have to be aware of how dry everything is or how wet everything is. Everything from your, your paper to your brush to your pigment. The more you do it, the more you just understand it and you can make it happen when you want it to happen and prevent it when you want to prevent it. That has to be very, very dry. In order to, bl to do blending, we need this to be very, very dry. And I think a lot of times that's where I personally run into trouble is that I don't wait long enough. I get very impatient and I think, oh, that's dry to the touch, you know, and I try to, to put in my shadows and things like that. And then what really happens is I end up with the bloom or I end up lifting my pigment because I didn't wait all the way. And one way that you can tell it feels a little bit cool, so it's definitely still wet, and also, I can feel it underneath. I can feel the moisture under there. It's a little bit of a buckle under there and it's cool. So it's not completely dry. And if you're in doubt, you can get a blow dryer out and finish it off and make sure. Let's go back and look at this one. Look how lovely that is. But if I were doing this in my artwork, I might keep that. It just depends on where it is as to whether I would keep it or not. I'll show you some examples. This iris was my very first YouTube video and I used an enormous amount of water on purpose. This was a very loose style. And now you see some granulation in here and that, let me get something else. That granulation was because of the the kind of pigment that I was using. It was the brand and the color that I was using. It just tends to granulate a lot. So that's not something that I did intentionally, but I love it. It really added great texture. It almost looks like veining here. So love, love, love that. Then, okay, so when I put the yellow down, it just seeped into this purple. And so you can see how lovely that merging is and right here now does that look familiar those are soft edges just like here that's how that happened this was clean water first and then the pigment and so the pigment seeped into that clean water but here i had put down this violet so that was the wet and then when i put the yellow here it seeped in and because there was a balance between how much water and pigment was in the violet and the yellow, they seeped in very beautifully here. Now over here, this is where I allowed pooling to sit. I did that on purpose because I wanted it to be a very thick, thick color here and some texture toward the center of this flower. Now over here, I allowed this huge bloom to happen. So what happened is I had put some pigment down and I came back with a very watery brush. It was not a clean brush. I had just painted this and I just dipped it in some water and touched it here a few times. And because there was so much water in my brush, it caused this hard, this bloom and with a hard edge where it pushed this pigment back. Let's see, so there's some nice feathering merging here. So this is a really good example of all the different ways these techniques, you don't even have to think about them too much, but if you allow them to happen, sorry, if you allow them to happen, they will happen on their own if you're just not too worried about it. So I painted this 
and I had this vase and I really wanted something extra. So the green had merged in, but I really wanted this to look more watery. So I dropped a big drop of clean water right there. And so it pushed all that gray, that's a paint gray, pushed it out and made these darker hard line on the edge of that bloom. And then there was a little more sloppy water down here that did the same thing. And let me put this over here. Oh, this one, I love this one. So on these radishes, blooms can really help any greenery, any leaf. See how lovely that is. And same thing, I just took my brush and I was just dropping in colors. And so I dipped the tip of it in water. A, you know, it was a dirty brush. It had green on it already. And I just dipped it in some little clean water and dropped it to make this happen. So there's a little texture here, then plenty of blooms here. So I love blooms. Okay, I got my blue dryer out and I, I dried those really well for us. And I got some clean water because we're going to need it for our blending. So the wrong way to do blending, let's say that this is a leaf again or a flower or whatever, and we want to put some shadow on it or some details or something. So we're going to layer it. The wrong way to do it is to add your water, but to not drag it all the way down, to only partially cover. And then we grab our other pigment and we touch it to do our shadowing. So we're going to have a good feathering here because it's wet on wet, right? Just like here where we have these nice soft edges and they're actually kind of went off the wet spot. So it's a hard line there because it wasn't wet there, but all these where it was wet gave us the nice soft edges. So we're going to get those soft edges here. here. Oops, I don't want to touch that. I don't want to mess that up. But what's going to happen is because we didn't cover this whole thing, we are going to get a hard line right here where the water stopped. And it might be a little bit hard to see because this is so light. I should have done this darker because the darker this is, the more that line will show up. So we'll just let that dry and see how that is. Now see here, see these hard lines? See how they're darker around the edge? It's because we had so much pigment and water on there that when it pushed it, it pushed it all to the edge. Same thing here. There's a little bit of a dark spot here, although we, there's not a lot of pigment in here. There was enough water to push a little bit of that pigment out and give us those hard lines, that dark line rather. Well, the, hard dark line. Now we could, now that it's very dry, we could go in with clean water and just a very, very damp brush, a clean damp brush. And we could try to lift that and smooth it out a little bit. I've personally not had much luck with that. It just messes it up worse. So if this happens to you and you want to try and take some of that darkness out, it's certainly doable but it's very delicate work. So I would just urge you to be careful. All right, see, we're getting that darker line right there because we did not bring that water all the way down. So let's do it the right way. Let's take clean water, not too much. If I put too much water, like in a spot right there on the dry, it's going to make another bloom. So we just want a little bit of water. And we want to cover the whole thing. And you might need to tilt your paper up just to make sure that you're getting every spot, especially because 
We don't want to keep going back over this too much because it will start lifting that pigment, that first layer. So now let's take some darker and probably didn't have quite enough water on there, barely enough. But if this were a shadow on this edge, that's how I would do it. And you can kind of drag it down if you want to. It's not, that was not very wet there. If I want to add a little more water here, again, we've got to cover the whole thing and just come up to it. Another good technique is to do a thin layer. Let's do a very thin, thin layer. So I am going to really dab it off. If we do a very thin layer and let's let it dry, we're not going to touch it. We'll come back to it. Here's another good exercise. So let's cover this whole thing in water. I don't want it to pull. All right. If we want two colors to merge together, one way to do it just cover this half and now grab the other color and do this half. And I'm not really touching the blue with my I'm not touching the blue with my brush. I'm just getting very close so that these two colors will seep into each other. Okay, I'm not really happy with that. So while we're waiting for that to dry, let's do this one again. That's very dry. I'm going to cover the whole thing in water. All right, and now I will try to get this consistency back again before that dries. Did that dry? Yes, let's, I think that may have dried a little bit. So let's re-wet that. And let's do it again. So we can keep dropping in pigment to get it as dark as we want it, as long as it remains wet. give us some nice, nice streaky look. 
And that, look how great that is. Love that. There's a little bit of granulation with this one. This blue can sometimes granulate. You can see the granulation over here too. Okay, back to this. So this little technique, let's take a little more blue and we'll do another one on top of there. Pick up the extra. This can make some very lovely flowers because we're doing transparent layers so that we can see the first layer through the second layer. And we'll have to let that completely dry. If we went over here and tried to do another one, it's just going to either pick this pigment up or it's going to merge, kind of like this. It'll merge into that one and you won't have a distinct line. And for this technique, we want to see that distinct line through the next layer. So what if your paints are not moving very much? We have lots of movement going on that we've talked about, different situations. The closest one is this one where it moved a little bit, but not so much. So sometimes if you have an inconsistency in your water to pigment ratio, it can make your pigments not move. And that's really not what you expect out of watercolors. You expect them to move. But you can really, you can use them like gouache and you can use gouache like watercolor by adding water to it. But you can use your watercolors more like an acrylic or, or more opaque paint just by not adding much water. But that's really a waste of your pigment. So I want something very thick because they are less likely to move. We have a fairly thick blue here. And then if I take a very thick green, I don't want any extra water in my brush. They're just not going to blend well. See, they're just sitting there. All right, let's do another one of those. I'll pick up a lot of that pigment because we want it transparent. So we have one space left. So let's just do an example with our flower and leaf that will cause a bloom. Just to complete our, our little sample here. So we have a good one, we have one that was too dry, and now we'll do one that's too wet since we have this extra square down here. So here's our pretend flower. I will put the leaf down more saturated. And 
I'm just going to keep adding to that leaf because that's often when it happens to me is I'll place my leaf down and I'll think, okay, well, I wish that were a little darker or, you know, and I'll go back over it with my brush like this where I'm trying to make it a little darker because your brush will continue to release pigment and water the more you brush. And then I'll drop in more pigment because I, I, I just want it darker. It's not really covering that up as much. Or maybe I want to add other colors to that leaf because I really love the multiple green color in the leaves. And you can already see it's starting to cause a bloom because that pigment is pushing the blue because I've just overloaded it. And the more you fiddle with it, the worse it gets. So just for comparison's sake, I'm, I'm just going to keep putting some pigment in here. And you see, this side is drier and much thinner. All the pigment and water I'm placing down are pushing that over because there's an inequality of moisture. So I hope these exercises are helpful for you. I hope you practice them regularly. The more you do it, the better you will get with it. I go through these every once in a while, and I, I found it very helpful to do this on a regular basis. And each time I'll use a different brush. So whatever brush you chose today, once you get comfortable with that brush and how much water and pigment that it holds, then do these exercises with a different brush because it will be a whole new experience. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you found a lot of value in this lesson and I hope that you found some tips to help you with whatever water control issues you may be having. If you like this one, please give me a thumbs up and let me know. And please subscribe if you haven't already for more watercolor videos coming up really soon. Thanks!